All right, students, in this lecture set, I'm going to cover a special topic called substitution reactions. Now, before beginning, I have to give you guys a warning. Chapter 8 covers substitution reactions, and Chapter 9 covers elimination reactions. These two topics are both fundamental concepts in the world of organic chemistry. To be quite honest, however, it's kind of challenging to teach one without simultaneously teaching the other because they're so very closely interrelated. Nevertheless, because this is the way our textbook structures it and I have chosen to structure it for our class, I will be teaching it in this fashion. Substitution first and in our next lecture set, eliminations. However, if any of you guys want to jump ahead, I actually, you can search on YouTube, Christians and Chemistry, substitution elimination and find a comprehensive lecture that I've already prepared covering both topics kind of squished together in a very short concise and easy to understand way after this lecture you guys should be able to know the mechanisms of SN1 and SN2 reactions if given starting materials and conditions determine whether a reaction will be SN1 or SN2 if given starting materials and conditions, identify the products of SN1 and SN2 reactions, including their stereochemical outcomes, and predict SN1 and SN2 products for reactions that involve benzylic and allylic halides. You should also be able to predict intramolecular substitution products. You'll note that in this slide I've listed all of the sections from our text that cover these different topics. So let's get into it. So generally speaking, substitution reactions look like this. There's some type of reactant that has a group, in this example a bromine, that interacts with some type of reagent, in this case hydroxide, in which a portion or all of this major reagent takes the place of the group in our reactant. So as you look at this particular reaction, you can see going from left to right that this reactant which possesses a bromine appendage has been converted to a product that now has an OH or hydroxy appendage in the place of the bromine. In other words, we could say that the OH, the hydroxyl group, has taken the place or substituted itself for the bromine. That's why it's called a substitution reaction. Now, as we'll see over the course of this lecture, there are numerous different groups, not just bromines, that can be substituted for, and many different reactants, not just hydroxides, that can do the substituting. Before getting into that, I wanted to show you one cool example from my graduate school years. Many years ago, I took this molecule, which I've numbered 89 for some reason. I think that's because that's the number it had in my dissertation. And I reacted it under these conditions to convert it into this molecule 97. I then took 97, which had a terminal alcohol at this position, and converted it into an aldehyde using these conditions. Once again, this is all above and beyond what anything that I've taught you guys yet in this class. I then took this molecule, 99, which has a terminal aldehyde, and reacted it with this molecule, which is called a Wittig reagent, to convert 98 into 99. Now, once again, you don't have to care at all about the details of these conditions because they're reactions I haven't taught you yet. <laughs> I took 99 and treated it with these conditions to convert this terminal group, which is an oxygen that's been shielded into a free oxygen or free OH in molecule 100. I then took molecule 100 and converted the OH into an iodide using these conditions indicated here. I then took this iodide 101 with an iodine right here at the position R and treated it under these conditions to convert the iodine into this molecule 102 that has, that's really a triphenylphosphonium iodide salt. You don't have to care about that all. The only reason I'm pointing this out is because of one thing. You'll notice as we look from molecule 100 to 101 that 100 has an OH here and it has been converted into a molecule that has an iodine here. In other words, the iodine has taken the place of the OH moving from 100 to 101. What type of reaction is that? Absolutely. It's a substitution reaction. Now just for the sake of interest, I'll show you some more steps. I took this molecule 102 that I made and reacted it with molecule 82, which is a molecule that I made separately. And I reacted them together under these conditions to form molecule 105. I then treated molecule 105 under these conditions to free up this masked oxygen as an OH, and then I took this and treated it under these conditions to form this molecule, which is called 12S-hydroxycosa tetranoic acid. It is a natural product that is a metabolite 
of some of the cycles involving uh, cycle oxygenase enzymes. That is, some of the pathways that are responsible for our bodies experiencing pain. We wanted to synthesize this molecule because we can make it on a large scale. We can do further testing on determining exactly how it operates in the body. Why in the world did I tell you this? Well, once again, the reason is because it features one reaction, conversion from 100 to 101, that is indeed a substitution reaction. So I'm showing it to you just to illustrate the fact that substitution reactions are important, and we organic chemists use them all the time. Now, there are two different kinds of substitution reactions, SN1s and SN2s. The primary difference is the mechanism. So in an SN1 reaction, some type of molecule, and I'm showing a generic one here in which R1 and R2 are just alkyl groups, which are once again just any hydrocarbon chain, that possess a leaving group, abbreviated LG here. Now, leaving group is any type of group that can be kicked off when an attacking group comes in. These are usually halides, like chlorine, bromine, or iodine, but they can be other groups as well. These types of molecules stir around in solution until the leaving group leaves, giving you a carbocation intermediate and a negatively charged leaving group. At this stage, something called a nucleophile, that is, any type of group that has electrons that can bond with a positively charged carbon atom, will come in, thrust its electrons into that hole, and form a bond, giving you a mixture of products. Now I have to point out two things about the SN1 reaction. First, the slow step that I've labeled here, which is the first step, is the formation of the carbocation. We also say, and are correct in saying, this is the rate determining step. That is, it's the slowest step in this entire process. Thus, the speed of this first step, which is very slow, is the speed that determines the overall rate of the entire process. Two, because the nucleophile, this guy right here, can attack this positively charged carbocation center from either side, the front side or the back side, three-dimensionally speaking, SN1 reactions give mixtures of both enantiomers in the product. Now I'd like you to take a moment to pause the video and examine this mechanism. Maybe even write it down in your notes before we move on and I show you the SN2 mechanism. And the reason is because I want you to be able to clearly and easily contrast this mechanism with that of an SN2. So here's the mechanism of an SN2 reaction. We begin with some type of molecule that, in principle, might look very similar to the one we had in our SN1. However, in an SN2 mechanism, the leaving group does not take off and leave us a carbocation intermediate. There's no carbocation intermediate. Instead, what occurs is the nucleophile comes in and attacks the leaving group in one step. Ba bam Kicking the leaving group off and giving us this product. Now, if you don't see the difference between this mechanism and the one on the previous slide, please pause the video and go back to look at it. You'll note that in an SN1 mechanism, the starting material floats around for long enough to have the leaving group take off and give us a carbocation intermediate prior to the nucleophile coming in. When the nucleophile comes in, remember a nucleophile is just any type of molecule that has electrons that can bond. When the nucleophile comes in, in an SN1 mechanism, it can come in from either side. Thus, you'll end up getting a mixture of both enantiomers. In an SN2 reaction, however, the nucleophile comes in and forms a bond with this central carbon, attacking from the side opposite that to which the leaving group is extended. As it comes in, it hits that carbon and ba bam kicks off the leaving group. A couple things we need to note are, first, the slow or rate determining step also happens to be the only step, this first step. There's only one step in an SN2 reaction. Two, because the nucleophile, this guy right here, can only attack from the back side, that is the side opposite the leaving group, we end up getting a product whose stereochemistry is inverted relative to the three-dimensional stereochemistry or configuration of the starting material. That is the difference between SN1 and SN2. Why in the world do we care? Well, stay tuned. I promise it will become clear in a little bit. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the slow step of an SN1 reaction is forming the carbocation intermediate. Hence, if I have a leaving group stuck to a primary carbon, 
it cannot do an SN1 reaction. The reason is because if I were undergoing an SN1 mechanism, the leaving group would have to leave and give me a primary carbocation, which is so unstable that it practically doesn't exist. In contrast, an SN1 mechanism can proceed through a molecule in which the leaving group is stuck to a secondary carbon. And the reason is because when the leaving group takes off, it will give me a secondary carbocation, which is stable enough to exist. Now, by comparison, a leaving group stuck to a tertiary carbon is much more favorable for an SN1 reaction because it would leave a tertiary carbocation. Now, what about this guy over here? If I've got my leaving group attached to a carbon that's one position away from a carbon-carbon double bond, this is a leaving group stuck to an allylic carbon. That is even faster and more stable than a tertiary carbon. Why? Well, I know that some of you are tempted to think if this leaving group takes off, it's going to leave me a primary carbocation, but that is not true. That is not a primary carbocation. That is a carbocation attached to a carbon that is adjacent to a double bond. Because of resonance, which we discussed last chapter, that positive charge will actually be shared by this carbon, as well as the carbon over here. That is not a primary carbocation. It is a primary allylic carbocation, which is even more stable than a tertiary carbocation. Now, by comparison, if we have an even more stabilized carbon, such as a leaving group attached to a carbon immediately bonded to a benzene ring, it will undergo an SN1 reaction even more favorably. If this leaving group takes off, gives me a positive charge at this position, which is called the benzyl position, you can imagine this positive charge looking to the lay person like a primary carbocation, but it isn't. Because you can draw resonance structures in which this positive charge is actually shared by this carbon, this carbon, this carbon, and this carbon. Thus, this is even more stable than an allylic carbocation and will be the most favorable for an SN1 reaction. Now, by comparison, SN2 reactions do not form carbocation intermediates. Remember, as I pointed out in the previous slide, the nucleophile comes in and attacks the carbon that's bonded to the leaving group and kicks off the leaving group in a single step. Well, bam! There is no carbocation intermediate generated. So what in the world does that mean? What it means is this. Tertiary carbons do not undergo SN2 reactions. The reason is because a nucleophile would have to get in and fit into a tertiary carbon, which is very, very hard to do because it's obstructed by three carbons. Secondary carbons will undergo SN2 reactions if the nucleophile that I use is an SN2 nucleophile. I'll tell you more about that later. You can imagine a nucleophile being able to come into a position that is only hindered by two carbons as opposed to three in our tertiary carbon much more easily. It comes in here and kicks off the leaving group, well, bam, giving me my product. Now, by comparison, if I have a leaving group stuck to a primary carbon, it will undergo SN2 most favorably. Thus, you can see that the trends for SN2 are the exact opposite of the trends for SN1. You'll note that I also mentioned this thing called E1 reactions. Don't worry about that. We'll talk about that in our next chapter. OK, another thing you need to know is this. In general, having a better or more reactive leaving group will increase the speed of any substitution reaction. Now, what in the world makes a leaving group more reactive? The thing that makes it more reactive is if it handles a negative charge better. A hydroxide, for example, doesn't handle a negative charge as well as a chloride. Hence, a chloride is a more potent leaving group and will leave more easily than an OH. A chloride doesn't handle a negative charge as easily as a bromide. Thus, a bromide will take off more easily than a chloride and be an even more reactive group than a Cl. And the trend continues. You'll note that having an H2O leaving group is the best. Now, what that means is this. If you have an OH that's stuck on a carbon, and that OH gets protonated, then we end up getting an H2O plus attached to that carbon. That H2O plus can leave as neutral H2, the hottest of all of these leaving groups, and allow my nucleophile to come in and take its place.